Test, test, test. Happy Saturday, everyone. This is Tony Leonard on this Saturday, 4 6, 2019. And I'll start here in just a second, but um, give me just one moment to finish getting set up. And we will begin. Going to be talking about some interesting things today. Uh, using Mixamo and how to create an, uh, just a, a character from using Adobe Fuse and how to get it animated in Adobe Mixamo or Mixamo uh, and basically customizing or modding uh, our character from ZBrush. I'm really excited to show that to you guys. Uh, it's kind of along the things that I was working with last week. And I'll begin in just a moment, but uh, give me a shout out in the chats and let me know that if you get anybody's there, anybody listening, uh, if you guys can hear me all right, uh, the whole nine yards, okay? So just give me one second, I'll be right to it. All right, so let us begin. Hi everyone, my name is Tony Leonard. I'm a concept artist here in Los Angeles, California. Uh, happy Saturday to everyone. It certainly is a lovely Saturday afternoon here in so SoCal, Southern California. Uh, so, where was I? Today, let me get my screen going for you guys. Derpity derp. There we go. All right. So last time around, um, there were a couple of things that I was working at. But I showed you guys some of the recent animations that I have been working on. Uh, I showed you guys um, this stage that I have put together. Uh, it's basically a model that I am blocking out with a, a few custom parts, uh, a few things that I've just got in sort of like just mock-up mode. Uh, it's some of like. Um, a story that I'm doing where I have like some jump ships and like drop ship kind of shapes uh, my Titan Trooper co uh, character which today I'm gonna actually explain uh, some of the animation half of things that I showed you guys last week or what was it like two weeks ago I guess last last stream uh, so I'm really excited to uh, show you guys sort of my process in this because I've been doing a lot of experimentation between ZBrush and a lot of other things um, and I know I've maybe slightly gone off my mandate and gone outside of ZBrush, uh, dipping into things like uh, After Effects, uh, Blender heavily, uh, Blender with a box cutter heavily. Uh, but all of these things I'm trying to use, you know, Fusion, Moi, all of them trying to create one thing, one purpose, and that's either props in a stage or an environment piece or mecha or ships or vehicles. Uh, character armor and in some cases um, I'm actually literally just sculpting up characters and putting them into a sort of workflow and then that workflow is basically getting sort of a, a concept or visual development look that I could use either in illustration or sculpting or animating uh, so I'm gonna be talking a lot about how to create uh, FBX animations uh, and playing with and saving out FBX's and today, say for example, uh, 
I have some other elements that I'm, I'm going to be, you know, introducing into this scene. And so I'm slowly uh, building some of those up. Uh, for example, uh, I've created another character and uh, another ship to put in that bay. Uh, this is just like a small kit bash slash uh, box cut that I did to create uh, just like a transport ship uh, prop vehicle. Has some thrusters on the back, maybe a few fins. Uh, I duplicated a couple of pieces out of kit bash. Uh, some of these radar units come from like say Vitali's. Uh, there's another gentleman by the name of Oleg who does some really great um, uh, kit bash pieces for hard surface that I've also integrated into sort of like the look. I've also used some of my own kit bash here and there, uh, pieces like cylindrical pieces um, and also, you know, things from like work stuff that I just like rip off a tiny little piece <laughs> and repurpose it, reshape it, uh, re-adding materials. And so I wanted to kind of show you guys kind of how I do these things and then how we're going to implement them, right? So, hey, hey what's up? FPX is basically sort of like a, a portable file that you can, it's, it's a, like a 3D format and it'll store things like um, textures, you can embed in textures into it, you can also embed animations into it. Uh, so yeah, it's basically a file format. Cool. Alright, so you know, usually within you know your 3D package, even within ZBrush, here actually I'm going to skip over to ZBrush and kind of show you guys some things. So this is a, a model that I have um, generated. Um, as sort of like a customizable base, right? And what I did is I've been messing around with the beta of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, you'll have to forgive me, my voice is a little wonky as i just getting over another kid cold coming into the spring season, so if I sound a little nasally, you guys have to forgive me there. But um, this is basically just like a, a base mesh that I generated out of Adobe Fuse, which is sort of like a... Uh, character generation software that Adobe has started um, putting out with their uh, cloud service subscription people. Uh, and you're able to go in, you know, along with Photoshop and a host of other, you know, software, whatever your package is for your subscription, and try it out. And basically, if you have an account, you can also use Mixamo, which is basically captured mocap data. In fact, I'm going to skip over and show you what it looks like. Mocap is basically web based. Um, and you can access it through your Adobe account or just go to Mixamo.com and I wanted to show you guys this because this is basically sort of just like something that I'm really starting to toy with but and, and I wanted to figure out what the limits of this are as far as like you know is it just like a basic template uh, what could you do inside of that template how far could you push it so I've been experimenting modding some um, some models out, like character models. Um, here is one between myself and a, a buddy of mine, Odell Palmer, who uh, works in film and television, uh, doing you know mostly like uh, digital doubles and sculpting uh, characters for VFX. Uh, and I concepted out this alien some time ago and gave it to him, and I was like, "Here, man, hook it up." And uh, we had fun with it. And so recently, I got it back from him, and I took it and Z remeshed parts of the body. Uh, made sure that the topology was tight. Also, th special thanks to uh, another friend, Jay, uh, who came in and did some topological fixes, I know, and Max. Uh, and then we just worked out, you know, uh, dropping the mesh inside of here. So once it's watertight, you know, as far as like um, if you have separated arms uh, joined in with the body, all I really had to do is sort of Z remesh this model just slightly. Uh, but the rest of the topology had subdivisions, right? Uh, and I'm going to show you how to prepare some meshes for Mixamo uh, because at times it can be a little bit difficult, especially if you're creating a, a character and it has UVs on it that you want to properly adhere to. Uh, maybe you want to go into Substance or Quixel and do some special things. Um, and that's basically what I did. So um, I'm actually creating custom meshes that I'm dropping into Mixamo and giving them movement. Right? So here's just like an example of a walk cycle that I did. And this is very non conventional, but uh, it, it's not exactly like human proportions, right? You know, uh, humans don't have like a head this large. Definitely, spine might be a little bit longer. Uh, the legs are a little crocked, uh, like a, 
almost like an inverted knee, but it's more like an inverted ankle, so where the heel is up, and basically this creature would walk on the pads of its front feet, and making it sort of appear very linky and sort of agile, um, definitely influenced by, you know, uh, uh, District 9 or something like that. And I wanted to create sort of like a, a homo crustacean character that would be really cool. So we dropped it in here after Odell did his sculpts, I did the bakes, uh, and then made sure to have UVs on the second round uh, after testing it. And so it works, you know, regardless of uh, maybe a few points where proper uh, weight painting could have happened in some of the mesh, that might be also something for more advanced users to sort of take a look at and uh, figure out which are going to be your soft spots or harder areas uh, painting appropriately to that, right? Because sometimes within some movements, you know, uh, if I did something like this, you may notice that there's stretching in between the pelvic area or like sometimes in the arms and shoulders, uh, maybe the map might get stretched when it's on top of this, right? But just to give you an idea of how it turns out, I'm going to put this away for a second, and I'm going to come back over to uh, where I had the file open in Marmoset. Okay, so here is my view in Marmoset, and I've gotten several poses from Mixamo, and I've it basically just imported the FBX, and after I painted this up in Quixel Suite, um, if none of you are familiar, uh, there is a software, I think it's actually out of support now, but they're moving sort of into some new tools that they're creating. Uh, Quixel did a great uh, Photoshop plugin for uh, Photoshop. And basically it's just like PBR texturing uh, from scanned uh, data or textures. Uh, and basically I've live painted those onto the model. So that's something that probably after I do this next model, I can jump in because I have a model that has UVs and as long as I create uh, sort of like uh, material IDs I can sort of go through and show you guys how to texture uh, and sort of live paint your PBR textures onto a ZBrush sculpt. So there's a bonus to this. So when I use Mixamo, usually if I was to play it and pause it, I can sort of stop at a sort of interstitial point and get a really nice pose out of it, you know. Uh, and then I can, of course, change lighting. I can rotate my lighting uh, and get sort of like a different look out of some of those materials. And this is just mostly the body and the bake as it is straight up, right? So later I'll have to add eyeballs back into the eyeball socket, but I wanted to sort of texture them differently. So I'll have to go into Photoshop and actually uh, get a 4096 texture going for an eyeball and wrap it around the eyes, right? easy enough. So let's look, I'm going to actually go all the way back and play it. And this is basically the sort of basic animations that I got out of Mixamo. And you know, it, it's a world of difference when you bring it into uh, Marmoset. And I think, you know, once you guys get going with, you know, your character sculpts, um, and or if you decide to use something that's sort of like a DAS 3D, or you know any of the time-saving uh, 3D modeling packages that you know make sort of like a base mesh for you to sort of customize. Uh, putting them in to this type of workflow is really easy, right? Just have to make sure to follow a few rules. One, um, I wouldn't do anything cybernetic or robotic uh, because if you go so far out of the scope of a human form, it has a hard time. It, I, I believe Mixamo's algorithm has a hard time reading. Um, any of the figures, right? And so basically what I do is I try to create, you know, things that are very, you know, uh, either T-posed or very easy to put the markers down for chin, wrist, elbow, groin, and knees. And out of those four or five, you know, uh, markers, uh, it actually automatically figures out the proportions of your model and how to apply it to the mocap data that is collected on the site, right? And that's why, you know, over here, you get a preview, you know, like let's say if I want to run cycle, after I upload it, uh, first of all, what you're gonna do is probably upload a character, uh, and then from that character, once it's uploaded, you're gonna place the markers at the elbows, wrist, 
chin, groin, and knees. None for the foot, amazingly. It actually automatically reads that out. So already this model, this kind of model with this kind of shape is kind of a success story in that because it had such weird non-traditional human feet and, and the legs are sort of cropped, it really placed it well um, in regards to, you know, being able to follow the mocap and uh, being able to sort of customize some of the, the walk cycles. Like, let's say, for example, if I give a run cycle and I stop it in place, you don't have to, but uh, if you're working within, you know, say your own space where you want it to run a certain distance uh, and, and then, you know, stop it or change the, the rig or modify the rig, <coughs> you might want to slow either things like uh, keep it in place and that way we have a complete cycle just right there at one point. And of course, you know, you could keyframe this out um, and cause it to move sort of like I showed you guys last stream around where I created the sci-fi uh, technical crew that was working down the ha walking down the hallway. It's a very similar sort of thing, right? So something like this where I could turn down the overdrive uh, and then of course adjust the trim so I'll get the full range of the animation from here, right? And I could really shorten that overdrive by turning down uh, the pace a little bit. Uh, you could also do things like, uh, you know, possibly add the distance here of the stride. And then you have a totally different run, right? And then at the end of it, of course, you can just download it, select FBX, and depending on whichever frame uh, per second rate you're working at, sometimes at very basic, all you need is 24, but uh, also, you know, something like uh, if you wanted more keyframes, more details in the movements, I'd probably go for like 60. But for file size sake, let's just go with 24. And then, of course, you know, uh, no keyframe reduction. Uh, skin on and download and with that download it'll run it'll give you the the actual animation as an FBX animation right FBX what is an FBX okay so let's get a more technical answers for that I'm gonna ask the all asking wizard Google the ever answering wizard Google will answer this this for me probably in better words than I can choose what is an FBX file? An FBX file is defined as such. Filmbox is a proprietary file format, .fbx, developed by Kdara and owned by Autodesk. So it's an Autodesk uh, file format, basically. Uh, and what it can do, what its capabilities are doing, is it can, it can store bones inside of animations, like an entire rig or a pre-established rig. Uh, and depending on its format between bin and ASCII, it can also embed textures. So like if you saved an FBX with animation and textures together, you could probably keep both of them uh, and just import straight away instead of using something like maybe a limbic animation where you need to keep an animation going from app to app. Like say if you, uh, uh, maybe a Maya guy or a Blender guy is creating an animation that's rigged, he wants to save it and be able to carry that over to Cinema 4D, he could probably, you know, go with two routes and one would be uh, Olympic data and or an FBX animation, excuse me. So in a lot of cases these I'm using FBXs because I do a lot of proofing inside of Marmoset Toolbag 3, right? And this is the kind of result that I get, right? So because I've done and placed probably here at the center one figure. Uh, once I import it, which in Marmoset is just control I, uh, and then I could go and let's say, for example, I'm going to grab, uh, where did it go? Out of my downloads folder, running, and I'll grab another running cycle and I'll drop it in. And it will import it. And because I have a lot of FBXs already loaded, it may take a second to cache this. Um, I notice generally when you turn, it goes through a spin cycle of trying to figure out, you know, or, or you know, or cache uh, how many files it has in the scene, and that might take a moment. 
So I'm going to let that sit for a moment, and then I'll show you exactly how I apply the texture. So we're going to put that away, and I'm going to come back to ZBrush. So basically, this is a character that I got out of Fuse, right? So let's sort of Fuse, and I'll show you guys kind of how this works. Basically, this is a character. Yep, sorry. Kind of trying to stay with everybody's comments. So, anyway, I'm going to skip over to Fuse. And I'm basically going to open up the last uh, file, which was the Jump Pilot. And basically, all of these work from scanned data, I guess. So. You know, they have like either scans that they've modified and textured here, and you can just basically sort of mitch, uh, mismatch the parts together, sort of Frankenstein a character together, right? So I made this one here, and it's kind of uh, inspired by another character. I think I saw some of the same combos in um, something by Beeple Crap, um, and he, he himself probably tweaked it a little bit, I'm sure, uh, between Cinema 4D and and Mixamo and whatnot, but it's a great way to kind of put like motion to a character and see um, uh, and change some details, just have something as a working base. Uh, if you have time constraints on designing and you really just need to build a proportionate human character and put some basic clothes on, that sort of thing, um, it's kind of neat to, to mess around with this stuff. Um, and it's really cool because you can sort of combine, you know, body shapes, um, I, if I wanted to turn around and make uh, this combo, you know, basically a, a male uh, body type, I could turn around and do that. Uh, also for the, like, say, the hat and clothing, you can come over to clothing and choose, like, a variety of different customs. Like, uh, if I wanted to change the jacket or something, I could just, you know, pick it, and I got a new jacket on this character, right? Uh, and along with the... Uh, items that you have as far as like the you know, textures and whatnot they're sort of pre-done but I think for, in my case I'm gonna go ahead and use some neat tricks to maybe sort of change some of these details um, so that's what I'm gonna do here let's go back just a second let me see if I can undo this go back to my other jacket so I'm gonna mod this out and that's why I wanted to bring it into both uh, ZBrush and also Photoshop so one of the things that I wanted to change, and let's see if I can do this, is basically come in here and paint out the SWAT mark on the back, because it's kind of uh, templatized. I suppose I could just make a fill and just, you know, create something over it. But, or, you know, maybe use a clone tool and paint it out. But it might get uneven as far as, like, say, the lighting and the details that you have already on this uh, more, you know, just pre-cut normal. So I'm actually going to try to go into Quixel really quick and see if I can use Indu to just really change some things really quick. And then we're going to have some fun just sculpting out some bonus parts to our character in ZBrush, right? So I'm going to come in here. I'm working inside of Photoshop and basically uh, it's kind of hard to get a hold of this tool now. I think uh, Quixel has actually stopped selling it and stopped support for it, but I still use it because it has such an awesome catalog that I just... Don't want to kick it aside but of course i am using mixer nowadays uh, along with uh, the bridge and mega scans which is really awesome stuff i encourage you guys to check it out if you haven't already in fact uh quixel as you know is a company very similar to kind of um i guess in the same market share as uh, substance but uh, it, it deals in pbr textures uh, and they have scanned assets that you can subscribe to and download based on a point system. It's pretty cool. Uh, and you can download their assets, some of which are actually ZBrush assets, you know, like um, rock formations, that sort of thing, or you can grab LODs uh, of scanned material and stuff like that. It's really cool. Um, so coming from like ZBrush, if you're going into some place like Unity or after, or excuse me, uh, Unreal Engine 4, um, Mega Scans is you know, Quixel is, is on point with the game on that one. 
Anyway, let's take a look. Uh, Okay, so something like this is actually Quixel Mixer, uh, and you can actually download Mixer and you know try it uh, under its beta right now, which is great. Uh, it's more of a procedural way to texture your models. So, like, if I wanted one area of texture plus the associated maps to sort of put in sort of in, inside of a UV space or something like that, <laughs> or when I'm rendering in, uh, say, for example. Uh, Octane, you guys have seen me work inside of Octane out of coming out of you know ZBrush and Blender and whatnot. Move assets to Octane standalone, and then when I want textures or that sort of thing, I tend to sort of put them inside of uh, uh, inside of. Uh... Oh wow! Did my window close? Oh, sorry. Um, I, I seem to put drop them on on models and tweak them a bit, and sometimes it looks pretty seamless, especially with. Um, like metal or hard surface materials, that sort of thing. Anyway, uh, getting back to Photoshop here, I just wanted to take and sort of create like a new shape over this. So I'm gonna get my lasso tool out and just very quickly sort of go over this outline and see if I can mod this map just a little bit with a shape. Right? I'm gonna try to be as exact as I can. Could have probably also used a little quick quick mask uh, to paint this in. There we go. So I'll take something like this and create a layer and fill it with white. So I'm gonna go here. Actually, if I click there, it'll bring it back to its defaults. This little thumbnail here. If you ever click it, it goes sets it resets the swatches back to black and white. And I'll hit X, so that's my foreground color, and I'll fill it. Uh, and as I fill it, I'll convert it to a normal data. Oops. Actually, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Sorry, I messed I messed up. Here, hold on in one sec. Actually, I should have converted the file first and then painted it out. But uh, yeah, basically, I'm going to use Indu for that. Actually, let me grab the file again. Sorry about that. I mean, you could just probably ebb it out, you know, just use like an airbrush to kind of uh, create a shape back there. But I think I was supposed to actually convert this file so that it knows that there's the rest of it. Uh, normal presets, map converter, so that, yeah, this map converter is actually going to convert it to other procedural maps that I'll need, like diffuse, that sort of thing, uh, which is not exactly what I want to do right now, but uh, just to show you that panel. Uh, Now I'll grab a new one and probably do that all over again. So I'm gonna go here really close in, just grab a lasso tool. And I'm holding Alt just to use the polygonal lasso tool. I'm gonna grab this. Right? Uh, and I could do something like using an airbrush. I'm gonna make another layer, leave that. So I'm gonna fill this with white. And I'm sure this actually should be able to take this. Yeah, for some reason it keeps dipping out. It's not masked out. Okay, I know what I could do. That's all right. I'm gonna actually keep this down a little bit. So it just creates like a another layer on top, which actually, if I could be smart about it, I could actually just add a mask, uh, a layer mask, and then just double click this and fill it with black, 
right? The detail is still there, but then on the mask, just take and draw another lasso over this. Right? Maybe shave a little bit of this back off. A little closer. There we go. And then if I fill this with white, there's the spot on the back that I wanted to cover up. Uh, and so I wanted to actually bring the, not the opacity down, but like sort of like the chisel shape of it. So. Basically, I'll keep that. Actually, just give it. Actually, I'll do this. Bring it down by a lot so it's a little flatter, and then I can work on top of that if I want. So it's got like sort of like a chisel shape, but I don't want it to deform out of the model too much. And then on the other layer above it, I'll get a brush out and I'll do something like maybe some custom lines on it or something. So I can take this, maybe that, bring this pixel down way, way, way down. There we go. And I'm going to work in white and just sort of make some markings on this, right? So there to there. And then I can take this and I can actually just use a vignette tool, sorry, and flip this, and I'll pair them up just on the other side, so that, that should work, right? Uh, and then I'll convert this one the same way. And while I do that, it's going to create just a little detail on the outside, sort of like some piping. But I want that actually that slant to go downward, so I'm going to go down, and it'll become like a cut inside of there, right? And so, sort of like this way, you can do some sort of like normal sculpting. So anyway, just that one detail, I wanted to change really quick. Let's save it out, right? So I'll actually stop Indo, and I'll close Quixel, and I'll just take this, and since I'm going to work on it later, I'll, or the, the work on it later, I'll just flatten it. So. image and I believe this was a PNG so I actually want to be careful not to I'll just do that and merge it down right so merged it's probably a little bit better than flattening and I'll just check that one spot again and I'll save this and I'll come back and I'll look here and see if it worked right right so yes the shape held and I flattened it out and created a little bit of detail just a nice little subtle cut right there this isn't the most highest res as far as maps go the entire map is actually a 4096 but when you look at the data it's actually quite small right uh, actually not FPX uh, I think Zolda uh, Khalil on Facebook is asking so I'm just gonna say it again it's F as in Frank B as in boy X as in x-ray uh, FBX is the file format uh, that I'm mostly using for some of this. Not all of this. Uh, sometimes either I use OBJs or FBXs to go back and forth. <laughs> but especially in the case that these have like a, have a, you know sort of like pre-established template stuff that I'm running through Mixamo and I have animations on them. The animations can only be held inside of a, an FBX coming out of it. I think there are two other formats on Mixamo that you can choose, but I don't think I've ever used them very much. Um, one is, uh, I, I'm not even sure if it's CAD data or something, uh, it's, it's like a, a format that I haven't really had very much experience with. 
But anyway, FBX. So uh, later on, of course, you know, just showing you these, this was just sort of like a comp of the idea and uh, taking the chair and fitting the pilot, you know, uh, animation in here to see how it looks. Uh, still, I have to go in and I'll probably, you know, or either me or uh, my partner Chosen, who uh, does a lot of animation with me, uh, when we put this into a scene, of course, we'll have to edit the rig um, later so that things don't intersect. Like right now, it's going through like the, the lift handle of the ship, uh, one of the control handles. And of course, I want to bring the other arm on up to, to and reposition it so that it's actually piloting the control stick. Uh, maybe move the legs up on the pegs and stuff like that or extend these mechanics out so that the feet can fit properly when stretched out uh, that sort of thing so uh, just to let you guys know also I'm sure probably somebody's gonna ask uh, these graphics here that look like holograms uh, so basically I'm sort of pretending that this console has like a you know holographic uh, HUD, HUD systems, you know, for its controls. So all of these will be pretty much flat or emissive, while, you know, graphics just suddenly appear to float uh, holographically in front of the, the control panel. And of course I would carry, carry this theme to smaller dials and whatnot. But uh, basically how this is done is, this is a shape, like just a 2D plane, with a transparent PNG alpha, right? So, a while back ago I made some alphas that um, uh, I think I presented to you guys. Uh, it's basically a set that I sell on Gumroad. Uh, if you guys find me on Gumroad uh, as Tony Koro, that's T-O-N-I-K-O-R-O -O on Gumroad. Uh, and it's just a, a sort of like kit bashing. It's, it's a set of PNG transparent files that you can use as decals. Uh, and some of the HUD stuff that I used, you know, I finally got to use it here. Uh, and basically, once you put it in, all you have to do is kind of set like uh, the emission and also albedo, al excuse me, albedo alpha. Uh, and this basically carries a lot of the color, and then this one color uh, carries a lot of the light. Because when you go into camera effects uh, and you actually show, like, say, the exposure or even um, open up the bloom, like if I scroll down here, you get get a little bit of bloom on the scene. It starts to look a little glowy, um, you know, like uh, maybe like a hologram would, right? And so it's just something to play with. You can change the opacity of the alpha, that sort of thing. Right. <coughs> okay, so with this one, we, I have the chair seated, you know, just as a prop. And if you notice, this chair is the actual same one from the Blender file. And this will be the transport ship that that pilot will be piloting. Right, and when done, I'll do probably a lot of my animations within this space here. So I'm just gonna uh, actually escape that GZ, move this up, move the window up a little bit, GZ, do a grab. So basically, within this operating space here, it's probably where I will load the chair, maybe digging into the mesh a little bit more. Uh, or either scaling this down just a little bit more so that we could get a proper fitting in this area. And so I'll have to cut a cabin area out of this model, right? So that'll be a little bit of fun for later. And then probably I'll texture it and uh, get it underway to my man so he can animate it. All right? So let's go back to ZBrush because I want to sculpt. And I know you guys probably want to see some sculpting. So uh, I wanted to kind of present sort of a, a way we could come in here. Uh, and maybe do some some cool stuff by like you know changing the helmet design a lot. Um, so I kind of pulled together some references that I thought you guys would dig. In fact, it's so hard to show this because it's on my pure ref is actually on my other screen here. Let me see if I can pull this the other way. There we go. So these just to show you are just like a few. I went on uh, my Pinterest board um, and pulled a few references for helicopter or like a F-22 Raptor pilot helmets, uh, F-16 pilot helmets, even the classic aliens, uh, I believe, what was her name, Pharaoh, the girl who uh, was the dropship pilot, wanted to see hers, and also the co-pilots, because interestingly enough, he has like some attachments to his helmet, uh, like a real, you know, modern day 
<laughs> attack helicopter pilot would. And so just to have some form language, just pin down a few of them for reference, right? Because it's always good to have some references in mind when you're sculpting or building something. Uh, and then, you know, you, you get, of course, those real-world lived-in details uh, that you can add, right? So let me just pull you guys. Sorry, I mixed around some windows here. There we go. All right. So uh, also, PureRef is a free app that you can get and you can use it. Um, I think they only call for donations to keep development for it going. So it's really, really cheap, and uh, it's, it's a cool little app to have, especially if you need to just have some hovering references on one screen or on, on your main screen and just size them down a little bit so that you can take a quick thumbnail look at things. All right, so I'm going to first start by appending a little bit of mesh. Um, actually, rather than append, you know what? I'm just going to insert primitive mesh and do like a sphere 32 just so it's a little bit low. And I'm gonna make it generally, actually you know what, let's get a quad one, polysphere. That would probably work better. Right about there. And I'm probably gonna subdivide this after I split it and start cutting into it. Uh, treat it almost like Dynamesh or something like that, right? But I just wanted the front end of it to sort of cut into because it's nice and rounded. And I want to create like a sort of an added, you know, rounded shape for the visor uh, up front. So I'm just going to split this. And I'm going to subdivide it a few times. And I'm going to use my gizmo, move it inside. I'm going to turn on transparent, come in here. line this a little bit to where I think what half I'm going to use. Here we go. So now I can just use like a move tool to sort of shape this up, right? Turn on symmetry. Let's see here. Actually, before I begin, I think I'm going to get out my clip curve. Uh, maybe take this area out. Right? So that's basically sort of the shape. It almost looks like a, a Russian helicopter helmet, as round as it is. Something like that. Maybe pull out some of these areas here. that part. I actually wanted to get the lasso, maybe work on this area here. So what I'm doing here is just basically masking with a lasso tool. For anyone that's new to ZBrush, I'm going to mask this off and if I hold down the control and click off onto the viewport canvas area, it will actually flip the mask. 
um, and then of course you know you can smooth things out by holding shift so I'm just gonna continue on with like uh, sort of getting proportional edits going now I basically kind of just want to play with the shapes and kind of figure out what you know what and where I want to do it, you know, like have sort of these shapes. I was actually imagining something like covering up the face part way, but uh, I don't want to overdo it with the dome of the helmet so that, you know, it starts looking like a like a beluga well or something in front. <laughs> like a, a, you know, serious headgear going. And let's see. So as I keep dividing this, I also want to use things like a Trim Dynamic. I love the Trim Dynamic brush. It's one of my favorite brushes. Also, can't beat the good old standard, Damien Standard. Does that make, make sense? Uh, just the Damien Standard. I don't know if it's a standard. It's a standard for some. It's so standardized that it's, it ships with ZBrush for free. So, there you go. But I know that uh, the gentleman who made it, who is also named Damien, uh, did a second brush. I think he sells it, or, or not even sells it. It's basically he has it on his gum road. I think you can just go and, and grab it. It's great. All right, so I'm going to hold Alt and sort of pick out of the geometry. Uh, and I do this a lot when I do a lot of shape building because um, I want to define some edges and or uh, some type of modular planner change and so the basic way that I can do that is basically sort of creating a, a sort of clay plateau of um, an area that I want to build up or and or separate from another object right so a lot of times you know I work with the Damien standard you know and alt to sort of push out and carve in and basically you know like overall like I've said this before but using this <laughs> and brush like a pencil is always awesome because uh, that's exactly what it's like. It's, it's like a sketch pencil. There we go. So maybe somewhere I actually screwed up some symmetry, but that's okay. Um, I think I'm going to even it out a little bit later because probably, you know, this. If I don't Z remesh this, it's likely that I would probably retop this by just going old school and creating like a, you know, an append method uh, Z sphere uh, topology around it for the general shape that I want, and then it'll be superimposed right over that old helmet, and I'll just leave it there because I, I I still want to keep some of the areas like uh, some of the workings of the straps uh, and the headgear that was already pre-existing. Uh, but I just want to blend it with some some particular mods, right? So that's one part of that. Maybe I could take uh, this, do that, and do that, and then I'll take this, mask that off, and I'll use my move tool again and do a little bit of shape finding. Maybe we could pull these out to the side of her head, shape these out later. Uh, maybe if I'm going to lose some more volume here, I could change the shape to Dynamesh and kill those subdivisions and, and then, you know, Z-Remesh it and get it back. But I still want to just keep doing some a little bit of developing here, so I'm going to take a Play build up brush, maybe. And let's go over to the brush menu and I'm going to hit modifiers. Uh, one is the auto masking. I'm going to turn back face masking on. And then under the modifiers area, since I want to use something like some subtle clay, I'm actually going to turn smoothing up to one. And if I'm not mistaken, that should. Be a little bit softer it's not going to be like your traditional clay buildup it's kind of like adding like a nice little like if I did two kind of like a little fat layer almost it doesn't uh, 
it's not too severe to, to try to, uh, you know, with, with the alpha that it has, because it has like a straight up square alpha that is usually, you know, like rough clay or something like that, right? So I'm just going to go in here and fill some areas. Doing a little smoothing by hitting shift, so that's why the cursor turns blue there. In. And let's go solo for a second because now things might get in the way. I'm going to maybe pick up some of those subdivisions a little bit more. Uh, and then, you know, at 7, what I can do is I can delete the lower. And I'm going to come in and let's try to make this uh, like a dynamesh really quick. So I'll use something kind of fairly low, like a. I think 224 probably would be a good go. I'm going to turn the blur to zero. Uh, I'm going to actually turn on polish and project and do it. Bam. So not too bad on the resolution, right? And of course, you know, the premise behind uh, Dynamesh, uh, for those that are probably new to ZBrush, uh, Dynamesh is a very, you know, nice way to make some uh, very quick base mesh shapes and stuff like that. Um, but it's it's sort of a dynamic thing, right? So every time I hold control, click and drag on the viewport, it's actually going to reshape and reorder all of the points that make up the mesh. And as you noticed, you know, of course, there's nasty stuff like some crazy pulls or tries in here every once in a while. But we're not going to really worry about, have or need to worry about that too much right now, right? So basically what I'm just trying to do is come up with an object that has a, a cool enough silhouette. And I'm using maybe just a, a few, maybe three or four brushes to do this sort of thing. So probably, you know, like when I've sculpted before and I come in and I show you guys things, I show you these, you know, and I just explain it but just for, for folks that might be watching that are new or novice to ZBrush. I feel it's probably a responsible thing to explain what Dynamesh is and how it works. So like if you hold control again, you know, you can reshape things and it changes the, the mesh entirely. Right now, I'm going to try to put a pause on that and just use like the trim dynamic brush. So if you hit B and T, trim dynamic basically works as a sort of flattening brush along the normal of things. And so I can come in here and kind of, you know, create like a hard bevel in this shape. Let me not uh, forget to answer any questions. Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, uh I, I think it's, uh, Somin, Somin Web, uh, yes, um, I, I think that probably Adobe had some different directions that they were going into and it didn't work out and for whatever reason, Quixel into their partnership and, but it, that's actually rather a good thing because now they're developing, you know, just from scratch, you know, uh, a different way of, of approaching the same tool, you know, getting us some of their awesome scans, you know, like uh, providing a way that we can use them in modeling uh, that's new and efficient. Um, it, you know, Mixer, I don't know if you guys have um, had a look at it, but take a look at um, some of the guys like uh, Victor Ullman. It does some really great stuff. Um, they just did a, a video where they textured an entire trailer um, short film uh, for GDC. It was really cool, and they used uh, Mega Scans for the entire thing. Wish I could have been there to see it, you know, in person. And congrat congratulate those guys because it was really awesome. But anyway, so let's keep going. Yeah. Let's pull it, make this a little bit large. And pull this outward. Maybe pull this up from the neckline. Go back, see how it sits on the model. Try to maybe get it back to more of an aggressive style to shape. That's the thing about helmets. Uh, they're always a challenge to do directionally because um, I, like, I'm a strong proponent to... to um, doing anything where you you sort of recognize push-pull directions so like 
there, there's always going to be a flow in a helmet. And this is kind of like one of those design theory things that they're not always going to tell you unless you go to art school or, you know, have some type of proper instructions. But a lot of times I always try to create two different elements uh, in hel helmet designs. One is, of course, you know, the, the symmetry, if there is symmetry. But um, balance and form and also being able to push in one direction and or pull in another, right? Like... Uh, this head, from the base of the head, everything sort of pushes forward because it overlaps over the head. Uh, it also does it in a downward motion where you could probably read the circle and come straight outward and therefore it would be pushing forward and be considered a little bit more of an aggressive shape rather than a smooth, sleek, or contoured shape, you know. Um, just watching form, you know, language in everyday objects you know, that sort of thing, um, having proper reference, I, th I say, is probably the best thing for sort of picking up a good hand uh, and learning that balance, right? So, anyway, one of the things I want to try to do here, I think the symmetry is getting away from me. Uh, so I'm going to pick a side that I like, which I think I like the left side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually go into my deformation tab, mirror, and get this side, and then kill this side by doing a mirror and weld, and then we can Z-remesh it, and it'll, you know, should be on point. <coughs> uh, so let's see, modify topology, and I'm gonna mirror and weld along the X. So the X being, like say if your model's right side, I believe that's positive X, so it goes from positive to negative, or either vice versa, but basically the, the side that you're duplicating when you do that, when you mirror and weld, is gonna be its right hand side, uh, duplicated over to the left. So if you had something that was on the left and you wanted to dupl duplicate it to the right, you can't do that. You have to go down to deformation, probably do a mirror on the X so that it mirrors and flips it, and then you can uh, mirror and weld it, which basically dupes one side and connects it and welds it to the other side of the mesh, right? So that's why we sort of have this hard, severe line at the center because it's actually balancing it out, and I have to probably sculpt this out, smoothing it, right? And then from there, we'll see how many parts we got intersecting, stuff like this. Um, if I want to basically take that out, I will get the move tool again, make my brush larger. I'm going to pull this back just a little tad because I think it looks cool if there's like a bit of a swoop and then some exposed parts. And then sort of a wide angle for the earmuff. And then we're going to come back to this, sort of look downward, and pull these guys sort of inward. And I'm not going to do it too much because I want to keep some of the cool detail like that, that uh, mic that she has. But I mean, you keep working like this, and you got, you know, this kind of reminds me actually of. Uh, something uh, Ko Yokoyama and his uh, machine and Krieger would do, you know, just have like a huge massive almost helicopter style helmet, but uh, yeah, so there we go. So let's take this, actually I'm going to just, uh, rather than Dynamesh, I'm actually just going to add some subdivision into that really quick, keep smoothing. And I'm going to get back to my sketch zone with the Damien Standard, make this a little bit smaller. Just go around and sort of lay out some general proportions. But um, you guys feel free to ask me any questions. I'm trying to, every once in a while, take a break. Uh, skip over and watch and, and see what questions may be there, but uh, do let me know if you guys have any. Ah, right. Uh, actually, the new cameras from ZBrush, I haven't exported those over to Blender. I, that's something actually... Good question. I've been really meaning to try that because I know that uh, the new cameras that you have in 2019, uh, you should be able to export that out along with the model. I know a couple of other things will export camera and model out together, uh, but I would try them and see if they work. I haven't really 
uh, mess with it yet. Usually a lot of times uh, the camera action I, I basically take sort of as it's keyframed and put it under... Uh, in fact, I think you can export it to a lot of other stuff. But it, like I've been messing with uh, C4D of late, uh, which is a challenge, but it, it handles some stuff like that where it takes cameras that you can set up. Hard to get those cameras anywhere else, I think, sometimes, though. Usually I just remember the, the settings of one camera and translate it into the next app. Just easier that way for me without doing a lot of hassle. Because, uh, I don't know, it's, it's kind of strange, but when I model, I actually model things with a, cute, a, a few keen beauty shots. Like, uh, if I turn on dynamic and I set up a proportion, like, let's say we go to the draw, and right now my camera is at 30, or excuse me, 50, uh, I may make this 55 or something like that, or <laughs> like a 75 millimeter camera. Uh, depending on the skew, I'll go lower, but 35 is just about general, right? So um, I'll, I'll do something like this, and I'll, I'll have certain views, like looking up under the chin, uh, that define a lot of the shape of, a, of something like this. Like even when I'm designing Mecha, like a lot of them, you'll see shots where I'm way down here looking up because I'm always interested in how the contours look from a, a very different or severe angle right and if it if it keeps up and it ho holds then that's that's awesome and I kind of think of my shots in the same way like uh, a lot of the times when I do stuff in Marmoset as far as like the, the recent animation projects that I've done in it I'm still experimenting but what I like to do is use those as thumbnails for my guy to come in and try to animate over it or take the animations and then say oh yeah totally I know what you mean and then you know he uses his expertise to take it to the next level so A little bird in my window. What's up, bird? There we go. So it looks rough now, but after a few minutes of refining, you'd be surprised at the results that you get. So I'm just gonna keep going here, get the underside of that helmet use the dynamic solo a lot I think I need to replace my Wacom tablet here it's, uh, generally strangely enough I, I use a Cintiq but uh, quite a bit when I can uh, but for 3D modeling I, I can't stand it <laughs> but, my interest is, I think, uh, having some sectors that are going bad. I need to soon replace it. It's kind of funny watching the death of a, a Wacom, because it, it starts to fail in certain areas. Like, just slowly. Until one day, you go to use it, and it's just got, like, the weird jitters over an area. So right now I'm just using an H polish to kind of bring some uh, like very hard planner shapes. Interestingly enough, quick shortcut key that I just used that I should probably talk about. Brush size. So everybody always uses the S. Did you know that you could use the bracket, open and close bracket, just like you do in Photoshop? It's pretty neat. Try it out. here, cut in a little groove here, gotta love helmets. Helmets are like one of the fun things in like hard surface sci-fi to do, I don't know why. I could do helmets for days, dude, just phew, space out. So 
so here's again here again it you know like I want like some uh, hard like planner shape on top of the dome so what I'm gonna do is actually just uh, widen this go lightly along this surface here and as you can see because I'm working on one side of a, a normal it's actually flattening that side but I could come and do it on the other side and keep this lip here and because I had polish on to the Dynamesh it'll it will respect that and actually polish it and sort of edge it out for me so I'm gonna keep that up along with heart H polish What API does ZBrusher use? I am not exactly sure. I'm sure they might have an API, but uh, that one would require a little bit of a search. I, I have no idea, actually, I haven't messed with an API for, for ZBrush. But I, I imagine that you could probably do some scripting for it, you know, using the Z scripts. Um, but again, I mean, I'm not an expert on it necessarily. I, I just build cool stuff in ZBrush, man. I, I don't code in it. Blender coding is another thing. I'm I'm not gonna. I leave that to my buddies who uh, have a good a good uh, stance on on Python scripting. I believe also that stuff. A lot of this stuff, you know, like a lot of developers, they code in Linux as well. I don't know. All right. Oops. There we go. So basically, that's kind of the cut that I want, and then I want to add, we'll add in some clay, just some like regular, good old clay, into this area, and then we'll start hashing that out. Wacom on marble gets jittery. I wonder. Like every once in a while, like I, I don't know if it's the contact, but like it's like one half of the tablet is going weird, and the other is okay. Or like the the lower part gets janky, and the upper part stays okay. It's always like one sector. I, I've gone through like into a what is it two, three, four, and five? I think tablets over the years. I think Intuos 3 was like the most awesome, but when I got this one, it was great when it came out. Love the wireless part of it, but sometimes there are some different uh, performance differences between using uh, the wireless and having it straight plugged in that I'm not always too keen about. One might say sensitivity issues. So. <coughs> Yeah, trying to get rid of this cough. Oh my god. Alright, so now I'm going to use a little bit more clay and put some something fun up front. So just like a sort of false detail up front. This is maybe like where uh, like a visor op uh, object would be attached. And let me see here. Actually, I'm gonna turn off dynamic perspective off. I just want to make one nice score along here.
let's see how that sits against the character, right? Because we're starting to add some like sort of secondary details. Before I get too headlong into that, I want to see how it turns out, right? Uh, also, probably, let's shape some of this up. If I was to take here, here, and maybe here, and I'm going to grab my clip curve again, and I'll just make a little chop here. There we go. Maybe a little bit more. Right, so we can keep that flat. And I'm go maybe flatten a little bit of the inside of this because it's taking a weird direction right about here. This will be basically sort of like a concept mesh for a helmet that I'm going to place over the model. And then I'll worry about cutting this up and doing topology a little bit later. But at least I'll be able to see my, my custom part, right? So if I wanted to proof this, I could probably just Z remesh it. Like if I cut it into a few different pieces, Z remesh it and uh, overlap it over the model. And then basically just have it as an add-on to it. So like if I add this to that T-pose, and then if I shell this out and maybe put UVs on it, I could probably add to the map or, or create like a different material inside of uh, Marmoset and then save the model altogether and then re-put it into Mixmo, right? And then it just as long as it has materials or maps that are all together that you can, you know, per UV group just drop on, you can probably resave and collect it all together. Because uh, if I showed you guys this before, uh, just not to detract from sculpting for a minute, but I want to just jump back uh, to. Did I close it? Heck yes, I closed it. I didn't mean to close it. Hold on a second. I'm just gonna minimize a few things. Ah, here we go. So in Marmoset, uh, what I was gonna say is. All of these are the different materials that make up everything in this file, right? So uh, it's actually making materials for IDs that are put in the UV group for each different area, right? Probably like, uh, how does it know that there's just body material, right? It's all in the same UV, the actual physical map, it's, it's actually broken up into different sections on the same map. That way it could utilize different UV space and those UV spaces could, you know, accordingly go on to the model. So when I add on a piece of helmet, I'm actually just going to make a separate, uh, you know, texture map and not associated with the main map. Make a new texture and slot all of those maps into each area. And then I'm going to add it to this uh, T-pose. And then I can take that, which has UVs on it, and put it into Mixamo and we can generate a, an FBX with proper UVs on it, right? So all of the existing plus new stuff that I'm going to add onto this, <laughs> I'll just add a, a, a new material that I'll generate maps for, and then place it on here by clicking and dragging from this area here, and it'll add that map or set of maps or material to the part of uh, mesh that I want it to, right? So there's like a couple of different things. It's not just the helmet that I want to mod out, but there's like, um, you know, things that I want to add down her pant leg. 
uh, maybe some armor collar uh, area around here, sort of like maybe kind of hide her, kind of like a maybe like an EOD or like an explosive ordnance guy suit, um, or shoulder pads or something that go around the arm, uh, something maybe to just change the silhouette and the pattern breakup, right? So that when I did this, I actually did it in a way where, like my Titan Trooper guy, it uses like dark grays, uh, saturate yellow, red, those kind of colors and carry that theme over to here. And I had to think about how I was going to distribute the color hints around the uniform because, you know, I didn't model this initially, like, you know, Adobe's made it, but I, I'm taking it from the standpoint that I want to like seriously customize it out. If I'm not going to actually do the whole mesh over again, I want to be able to do some major parts that I'll change, right? So that's why we do it here. Back to the fun. So I'm just going to take and build up a circular shape here. There we go. As I flatten that, things start to take a little bit of form. I mean, you can use other stuff with this. I mean, it's just like, with Dynamesh, I'm actually just wanting this for the, the contour of the shapes, right? And then when I come back, I'll add other bits, like, you know, maybe a, a few hard pieces from a, a Z modeler might be in order or something like that. Just uh, whatever the design sort of calls for later. So I'm just going to try to polish some of this out, get it nice and formed up. And then when I have, you know, all of the lines that I want, I'll show you guys how I usually take something like this and um, Z either cut it out. Uh, piece by piece. So in other words, all of these modular sections like the head plates and stuff like that We can separate all of those or we can extract pieces from them. We can do a lot of different things, but Namely, I just wanted to do today's exercise to just get some sculpting time in and kind of figure out, you know uh, Silhouette wise what kind of design I wanted to work with Because uh, you know, I mean the the helmet that was on the character was nice and fine and all but it's kind of like a something like a, a Delta helicopter, you know, operative would wear, or like a like a Army door gun, gunner or something like a or Air Force door gunner would have on an Osprey or a chopper or something. We'll get to that stuff kind of stuff later, but right now I just wanted to kind of come in here and have some fun with some shapes. And there's a lot of new stuff that I wanted to show you guys, um, even and I. Before I leave today, I uh, leave you guys today, I did want to try to take a few minutes to sort of show you some of the new things inside of 2019 uh, ZBrush that are really awesome, especially for uh, doing illustration work. So, you know, while I'm doing sort of like a proxy mesh of this in ZBrush now, um, there are certainly ways that I could go and visually develop my project a little bit more on the 2D side. And here's where a lot of the, the 2D stuff, and the, hence the mandate of, of my stream uh, on, on ZBrush Live, uh, doing t 2D stuff and, and using uh, the new render sets is really cool and exciting. Uh, and very, you know, like handy. Just totally handy. Like, I, I mean, it, it's, it's such a time saver to just be able to, like, you know, have a BPR set, flick it, you know, take it back to Photoshop from render, you know, start messing with that. You know do some add-on things like sky's the limit right whereas it used to be that I had to just like put down some hard drawing skill um, you know imagine something or take a model and paint over it you know and that was about it but you know stylistically I'd have to pick a style you know like either a gray render or I'd have to manually go in and do a lot of like fill work and stuff like that now you know it's been cut down to a little bit more of a minimum so that's pretty cool. Regardless of what you say or how skilled you are, a lot of times, you know, designers just don't have time. You know, with very <coughs> quick types of uh, deadlines. And so things that save you time are always going to be uh, uh, pretty cool. 
you know. bringing this ridge up a little bit, pulling this geo out. And then I'm going to take the trim dynamic again, sort of harden this out. just thinking to myself what if some of the shapes in this had some very like hard uh, geometric cuts in it like, like like the planner change was really severe like a uh, stealth stealth fighter kind of shapes or something like that it might be worth it to see building a sort of low poly to higher poly type of um, helmet shape you know and just add it in segments onto the existing helmet, that sort of thing. But, uh, let's, you know, let's do this. I'm going to grab one of Molochus the Bra Black's uh, brushes here and go to town. Love his polish. It's really cool. If you guys don't know him, there was a, a gentleman who used to post quite, I don't know, I guess he still probably posts, but his, uh, really talented at using ZBrush and, uh, for sculpts and various things, but his name is, uh, he goes by the moniker Molochus the Black, and he created these brushes that are insanely great, they, you know, like they've been around forever, uh, since at least I started using ZBrush in, what is that, like R4 somewhere around there, R5, um, for ZBrush 4, when it was out. And he was, he had the, the brushes up on ZBC, they were definitely worth a grab back in the day. So, let's see. Yeah, I don't know about that. Maybe it pushed it in a little bit too much. Actually, if I keep the same brush, but I hold Alt, it'll actually undo some of what I did. Getting some good surfacing out of clay, though, it's, it's, it's a hard one sometimes, but generally, if you keep working and keep refining it, you can get it in there. Of Doom Guy, <laughs> the helmet of Doom Guy. I'm not exactly sure which one that is. Are, are you? Oh, the, like the the Doom Patrol helmet guy, or like, is that what you mean? Not sure. Focal length that I use in perspective camera. Uh, when I actually change and look around in the different perspectives, like generally I use any of these. Like if I'm doing something where, like it's more of a fisheye lens or a, a, like really high perspective. Um, then I use 18, 20, 18 to 24. I don't use 28 too much. But then it's like normal focal length, 35, uh, maybe to 55. And then for something that's really wide angle, where you want to get a lot of the other things in, uh, that you would have into a camera frame into the shot, that's when I go to like 70, 75, you know, or, or even up to 80 um, as far as like the, the focal length. Is that what you're asking? Uh, Mitzrian? Mr. Lopez? Mr. Lopez? I'm not sure. My bad.
Uh, no, I don't. I don't activate and deactivate it. I mean, I, I just usually work under one focal length. Like, uh, generally when I sculpt, because if I sculpt characters and I need to see the human form, like, pretty straightforward, a lot of times I go up to draw it and I'll just make it, I think it used to be, its default was like 55, um, I bring it down to like 35 and look at it. Because it's, it's probably going to be the close, the close, uh, the closest to human perception, I, I suppose. Um, as, as far as looking at something straightforward, it's closer to like a 35 millimeter lens. into here, create sort of a lip on the inside. Continue to work on some shaping here in the helmet. So I'm just going to use a Molokas brush here that has a pretty high bevel on it. Kind of come around and lazy in some 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 cleanup around these these edges here. I'm going to just hit smooth so when I get around here and try to clean up, it's not smashing some of the other bevel on the other side. Like that could smooth this out and repolish it later, right? By the way, today 
is the birthday of Justin Gobi Fields. And a lot of us here in the ZBrush community know him. I just wanted to say happy birthday, bro. If you hadn't happened to have a chance to watch this, I guess I'll, I'll hit you up otherwise. But uh, stay good and have a, a, an awesome happy birthday. Just remember that. It's like, man, somebody, somebody I was going to give a shout out to. And I totally forgot who. And then, bam, there it goes. So happy birthday, Justin. <laughs> Somebody else's birthday is today, too. Somebody very, very zebra-centric. Who is it? Is it perhaps... Kyle! Kyle, happy birthday, man. Much love. And congrats on the baby. Alright, so... Uh, let's see. it all right so one of the things that I'm gonna do to split this up later and I'll show you guys this now is of course this is only one poly group right and so to work some of these pieces and refine them later as I sort of cut them out of the mesh uh, will be to go ahead and just use like um, masking, right? So I'm gonna go over to my not lasso, but just a lasso or a pin, masking pin. I'm gonna start marking or demarking these areas where I have major cuts, and just create some poly groups for them, right? Going around, just painting it up. Try to stay clear of the line here. And if you can, try not to double tap. And, you know, when you pick up the mesh and reapply it, because if so, it will blur the mask. But you can also try to sharpen it back up. Right? So I'm going to show you that in just a sec. There we go. There we are. And if I wanted to clean it up, I can just hit Control and also Alt, and it will actually sharpen, right? So if, whenever you mask an area, if you hold down uh, control what it's gonna do is of, of course a you can invert it right like there's a piece of mass that I need to really get rid of right off the canvas but you can also sharpen the mask right and blur the mask so if you hold control and just simply tap on the mask it blurs it out a few times so these edges will become a little bit softer like a gradation right but if of course if you undo that a few times and you actually hit control alt and click it a few times you see how the mask is actually tightening up down here so you can actually get like a more of a cleaner mask out of performance out of your applied masks so I know sometimes it's kind of hard to maybe control with just like a, a round brush but you can actually clean it up quite a bit to where you oops, see that's exactly what I mean Be sure not to let your Wacom double tap or something so because it'll blur it out I'm gonna keep it nice and sharp or at least as sharp as I can. So I'm gonna go out here. Right. And I'm gonna finish this. Oops. There it goes. There we go. There we go. 
Okay, so that's tight enough, and then I'm just going to hit W, or excuse me, Control W, and that should create part of a polygroup. And why I'm making a polygroup now is because basically when I pluck this out, I'm going to take some of these shapes, uh, maybe do something like a polish by groups, so it'll clean up the, pa the, the, the edge of the image, or edge of the piece that I'm trying to pluck out. Sorry, not image. Um, but basically I could separate this out, out and clean it up a lot easier if I have polygroups along its edge. Um, and basically all of these little frayed pieces here, I can actually clean those up with uh, polished by groups, right? So maybe even la relax the mesh. And then I, if I Z remesh this, holding in some of the edges uh, with the other, like, um, not creasing, but uh, actually it'd probably be easier if I show it. This is sort of a, a method I, I, I learned from Marco Pluth of the Chaos Masons guys. Uh, and they, they did a really interesting article uh, that was on ArtStation, I believe. And he was talking about his process. Uh, and then basically what I'll do is I'll just go around and complete like a, an area of mask and then just take it right out. You know, like a, probably after doing this before it was masked, I should take um, some of the subdivision levels and delete the lower because I really don't need it. This is Dynamesh. If I wanted to, I could just redynamesh it at a higher number. So I'm gonna actually take this and delete lower because I don't need those subdivisions. This is pretty high enough for what I needed. Uh, and additionally, of course, you know, since, uh, what is it, before 2018, you could of course use the, sculpt the Sculptress uh, feature and basically start working in Sculptress and build up some of these details if you wanted to, right? But right now I'm just using Dynamesh because it's sort of a tangible form or way that I can just take some of this and bash it out uh, and then you know start cutting up parts and then use those parts later uh, for real geometry right or retopologize re pieces that are properly quoted out I should say <coughs> okay so let's keep on keeping on Ah, no problem, no problem. Glad to answer. Actually, let me spread it around and just make sure I'm not missing anybody's pro uh, questions. Uh, muscle simulation for animation? I, that I haven't done. I think uh, most of the assets that I create are probably like in the medium, sometimes to high, like game res stuff. Uh, true film. Uh, style uh, topology with you know like actual muscle simulations underneath I haven't uh, messed with you quite yet but I have been interested in doing so so we'll, we'll see <laughs> how it goes in the future uh, a lot of the stuff like you see me mess with if I just might take a minute like um, this scene will be one stage that I, I will I'm actually in the midst of translating this scene from blender over to c4d uh, excuse me but some of these areas have uh, points where I, I've actually taken bits from, um, you know, ZBrush, you know, combine them together, um, you know, a lot of kit bashing I tend to do inside of ZBrush, along with building original, you know, parts so that I can sort of cause a natural blend, just not straight up kit bashes per se, but um, there's always problem solving with figuring out, you know, or using, you know, kit bash pieces, and, you know, and sometimes you use that in paint over stuff. <laughs> sometimes not at all or sometimes build a piece that's even similar and replace it so it really depends it really depends on the end result of the topology that I'm gonna get or that I can get from it in the end right so this is one that actually I'm still adding pieces on to but I have to switch from blender to adding this over to cinema 4d so I'm just slowly kind of moving pieces over and sort of trying to re-render there but it looks pretty good in Eevee, as you guys saw. It's just, um, you know, it depends on where you're going to go, right? <coughs> um, in the other animations that I did, like, say, let's look at the bug lady prawn here. So when I did this one, you know, of course, the, the only simulation that's happening is basically the data is mocap data that I can set standards to, right? So there's no muscle or anything, and but there's there's actually rig for the fingers, and, and the, the rig for it is actually 
done quite well. I, I don't know how it would solve something like this. I haven't brought this rig in to see how it was set up, but usually my buddy can take it and rework it so that we can get, you know, an original animated piece out of some of the movement, right? So, like, it's like, yeah, I like that movement. We add it to the model. Then at certain keyframe points, we'll start editing, start moving stuff around, and he's, you know, working the matching and stuff like that, right? But no, no muscle sim as in, like, Cloverfield level muscle sim under a creature or something like that. I haven't done that yet. Things to, things to learn. Okay, so let's go back to this. I want to take it out of solo, so let's see where we are with the girl. And looks pretty cool. Just think that we need maybe a glass piece, right? So I'm going to actually take a... I'm actually going to take a, a Q-Mesh. Yeah, let's do a Q-Mesh. Q-Meshes are cool, right? All the cool kids are doing it. I'm going to go in here, get a Q cube, and this cube will become a visor. So I'm going to take this, move it down, and actually let's see if I can stretch this out. Right? Split this. And then I will go Q, B, Z, Z modeler. And I'm actually going to do this by the face. But I'm going to keep that side face and just delete some of the back and top. Delete. Right, so we have this nice wrap now, and just because I can't see the the back faces, I'm going to come into display properties and do double, so I can see the whole object. Uh, let's do solo really quick. And if I look at it from the side, I'm actually going to mask the front, and then I will use the widget. And the widget, you know, you can move it around. It, you don't, it's not like, you know, you have to use it exactly from one point, but if you hold down Alt, you can place it in a custom position. And then what I like to do is just bring this out. Oops. Actually, you know what? Let's do this. That's the front. There we go. There we go. I'll mask this. Pull this back a little bit. And of course, I'll have to insert a few times. Get some inserted. There we go. Just give it a little bit more geometry so we can curve this around. Actually, oops. tool and while it's in the widget I'm actually going to hit alt click here for the center and it'll align itself to the front of the piece and pull this out just a tad so I'm just getting a basic rounded piece that I can chop up or either just play with the polys and I'm just pull pushing and pulling polys just to make like a visor piece and I can customize this so I want to kind of put this in the area of oops here, be able to raise this up and maybe get an angle here. Try to sculpt it in so that I can match the angle of the, the helmet and cover it, right? It's a little push and pull tweak. Get that 
move brush out. Pretty fresh beat right there. Anyway, let's drop, move this up, maybe push this out a little bit. There we go. my tablet is going kind of weird. It's kind of funny. Watch it slowly die. Here we go. So we'll do something like this. And then we'll kind of nest this back into oops. Back into the model a little later. We can use this. So that looks like it would cover the face pretty well. And of course, you know, you want to get some quick thickness out of this, right? I think I've matched the contour enough to where I could nest it if I wanted to. So I'm going to get the Z Modeler brush again, BZ as the shortcut. Uh, and then I'm just going to basically take QMesh, uh, the entire polygroup all, and maybe quarter step. push this inward a little bit creating some thickness and boom an instant piece of geometry right and I can start cutting and chopping this up if I wanted to um, probably I'll add some subdivision to it so I'll check it its shape uh, just hitting D using the sub uh, dynamic subdivision which would be up here right and then the smoothness I can change so like Maybe if I tap there and I enter four, it's actually going to be five subdivisional pieces. So if I wanted to sculpt it up or something like that, I could do that. like a helmet to me. There we go. Get that move again. Maybe pull this area out. Oops. It's a little bit too much. There we go. So after a little fiddling later, I think I'll probably add, finish adding that in. Looks pretty big. 
I don't know. It's still going to check some of the balance, maybe move that headpiece back a little bit. Right? So these are the kinds of things that I'll mull over over the next couple of days, probably building this out. So let me just take a few minutes in my last uh, 10 minutes, because I'm gonna, coming, we're coming up to the top of the hour. But basically, that's just like how I would build a concept mesh for this, right? And I'll continue to you know harden this out. The next time around, I'll have this ready and show you guys what I did, right? But pretty much that's what I'm going to do is add on pieces, maybe add on a, a, a collar, maybe dial some of this head shape back a little bit because I think it's swept maybe just a little tad bit too forward, you know, maybe somewhere around there, keeping the bulb up front but not not too too high or maybe I'll cut into it we'll see maybe I think probably this needs to come, come a little bit lower so we can still see the face because it looks to have like the weird kind of drop-off point usually if it doesn't work too much from this angle like I kill it and then just start over again but we'll try to continue the same mesh and keep it going into next stream actually I'm gonna be on twice this month so Today and then um, next time around should be Saturday after next. Uh, so I will see you guys soon then. But um, let's do this first. So let's say, for example, you wanted to use this for illustrative purposes, for like maybe you want to do some edits in Photoshop or something like that. So just a really quick way now that we have 2019 is I'm going to hit the comma key and come into um, Spotlight, right? And of course, you know, you usually have like your recent project files and whatnot. Uh, I'm actually going to come over to uh, render set. And in the render set folder, these are all of the uh, presets that Pixelogic gives you with ZBrush, right? And some of my favorites are these in, in and around here where they, they are the black and white anime and or sketch um, uh, render styles or, or render sets. That you might find there's a couple of more so please do have a look through some of these some of these are really cool uh, I guess the various artists and stuff had put together you know and various guys over at Pixelogic put together different <coughs> um, settings like some of these I know probably Joe dressed and <coughs> Paul have put together and they, they're really cool um, as far as some of their effects and I, at first I didn't understand it when I jumped into it myself but then I had to take a look and I was like Wow, this is really handy. So if I click this and double click it, you're not going to probably notice anything right off of the bat. And what it's doing is it's loading into your project this this actual like render set look, right? So every time I hit comma and I come out of spotlight again, and then maybe I hit the BPR button, it's actually now drawing this with this render set style on here, right? So I could actually turn this into an illustration and maybe work on it in Photoshop for a while. Let's say if I turn on the perspective, uh, and I look from the back, let's try a different one. I'll come back up to render set, maybe grab this one here, come out of spotlight again, hit uh, shift R, or no, sorry, yeah, shift R. And there are some with halftone settings, so like, if you, of course, if you go into, uh, what is it, render and the BPR filters, BPR filters, there we go. So all of the filters are named in these slots. So you, as you click through them, you'll be able to see here what type of filter it is. So F2 is like flat shading, F3 is paint. Uh, one of these is going to be the halftone, screen tone dots, right? And of course, you know, you can choose the blend mode and you could choose the size and the opacity and the color, which is really handy because um, although I have a screen shade uh, or screen tone, uh, a screen cone catalog that I very meticulously made in Photoshop that acts, it, it's like a master template, right? And the, the unique thing about that is it's actually measuring line per inch. So at bitmap, so you can actually take those and apply it to uh, raster artwork and still keep the cleanest shapes in, in print um, but these are great because I could actually take it and do the same thing and when I separate line art from you know say just like black and white line art I could grab those halftones with it and keep it very clean for, for illustration so it's actually pretty neat to mess around with I, I would toy with some of the settings here in the filters um, just take one of the templates they're always gonna be there they, they won't change 
Um, but start playing with those and we'll talk about those more in the future. All right. So I'm going to finish here and take a break at the top of the hour. Any last questions before I, I pick up? Awesome. Thank you for saying great stream. I appreciate it so much. Um, and of course, you know, if you guys have any questions, shoot me uh, comments uh, over Twitch, you know, over the Pixelogic Twitch for ZBrush Live. Um, you can also ask me questions um, on Facebook. You know, I, I have a, a site for my, my own little studio venture, Tony Koro Studios, um, if you look me up. Uh, but I'm also on YouTube, so uh, do let me know if you had any questions on previous streams. And of course, I, I during the week, I try to look through the comments of these streams and answer people's questions, so everybody can try to follow along if you're following along. But uh, let me know how it goes. Uh, do you have a good tip to pose the character? Okay, so kind of along the same lines as I was mentioning, uh, posing. So utilizing Mixamo is a kind of cool way to get some posing because if you like were to stop in the middle of an animation you get such a natural pose out of this that you could actually modify this into a shape that you could use for a pose uh, and there's some more dynamic poses in those collections if you pause at any given point a lot of them have some really interesting poses especially on the dynamic stuff like if you're doing superhero or more action oriented artwork and you want to model to you know be really sprawled out in the extreme you could probably do that but you can also bring the fbx animations as i was talking about if you bring those out into maya max blender uh, whatever your 3d package is most of those will import uh, fbx animations and if you play them you can edit the actual full rig that's on them right so it's pretty cool yeah, in this case, I generated this model from a, a low poly uh, that gets kicked out of Adobe Fuse. Uh, and it's it's so easy. I'll just take a few seconds to maybe do this. I don't want to take too much time because I'm sure probably somebody else is going to stream. But uh, I drop a low poly into here. And then I can either sculpt these up and get them high. Or I, I just bake all of the information in later via maps. So that's kind of like, you know... This is low because I used a sort of template-based software like Fuse and what it is to just use some custom parts to build it. But what I'm going to actually do is take the low poly that it kicks out and start changing and customizing some things. So it actually might get to a high poly point, but I'll actually retopologize so that the extra parts that I build match the low poly of the mesh. And then it's pretty easy to just fetch it up to Mixamo and start animating, you know, and then we move forward, right? Cool, cool. You guys have an awesome weekend. Uh, I know I'm going to try starting with coffee and getting over this cold. But have fun, guys. Namaste. Peace.